These are some of the famous tessellations from the notebooks of M.C. Escher. As evidenced by the popularity of these designs, there's a sort of satisfaction in the way the creatures fit together. I'll argue that the most beautiful thing about Escher's tilings is their symmetry. When we use the word symmetry in everyday speech, we often restrict it to mean mere symmetry, maybe because that's the kind of symmetry that us humans roughly follow. But symmetric just means that there's some transformation that leaves an object unchanged. A starfish exhibits rotational symmetry, because if you rotate it by one-fifth of 360 degrees, it stays the same. A wallpaper has translational symmetry, because if you shift it over by two feet, there's no difference. All of M.C. Escher's tessellations have at least translational symmetry, but we can classify them based on the other types of symmetry that they have. For instance, look at this lizard design. It appears in reptiles and in metamorphosis. If you rotate it around the point where three heads meet, the image is invariant. There are actually three points of rotation, but I'll let you find those yourself. These birds, on the other hand, which appear in day and night, don't have any rotational symmetry. On a first glance, you might try to find an axis of mirror symmetry, but you'll find that that doesn't exist either. Instead, this pattern has glide symmetry, that's a mirror and a translation at the same time, like footprints. Categorizing art based on its symmetry might seem like a novelty, but symmetry can tell us a lot about how an object behaves. In biology, a plant or an animal's symmetry can hint at what it does and how it moves. In chemistry, the symmetry of a molecule tells us how it fits with other molecules and what kinds of chemical reactions are possible, what the shape will be when the molecules connect to form crystals. And in physics, according to a fascinating result we call Noether's theorem, the symmetries of the very space we live in lead to the conservation laws that we know and love. In this video, we're going to look at a variety of symmetry groups, going, I guess, roughly from least symmetric to most symmetric. The most symmetric thing that we look at today will be our universe. M.C. Escher's tessellations will be somewhere in the middle. To start off our journey through symmetry groups, we have to know what a group is. So we'll look at a starfish. But I don't want you to worry about mirror symmetry yet, so maybe a starfish with little bends on his arms. There are five unique positions we can move the sea star to that leave it looking the same. This makes a set of five positions, and for convenience we'll label them A to E. Now consider an operation that combines two positions one after the next. We'll call it composition. That means that starfish B composed with starfish B gets us starfish C. D composed with C wraps around and gets us back to A. I'm sure if I tested you on other compositions you could figure it out. But there's a few interesting things to notice about composition. First off, no matter what two poses you compose, you always get another pose. You can't move the starfish to a totally new position that wasn't in the original set. In math, we have a word for this. We say that this set is closed under composition. Another thing to notice is that anything composed with A, a rotation of zero degrees, is itself. So we call A the identity element. You'll also notice that for every pose, we can find another one that composes together to get back to A. Since A is the identity, we say that every element has an inverse. Finally, one last little property of composition, it's associative, just like addition and multiplication, like how you learned in elementary school. These three properties are called the group axioms, and they define a mathematical object called a group. A group is a set, along with an operation that acts on that set, that fulfills these axioms. It's associative, there's an identity element, and every element has an inverse. The poses of our starfish, along with the operation of composing them together, form a group. But all kinds of things could be a group, as long as it fits those axioms. The integers, along with addition, also form a group, because if you add any two numbers, you get another number, and all the other axioms. For this group, the identity element is zero. Another interesting group is the Rubik's Cube, specifically the set of all moves along with composition of those moves. You can always undo a move, so every move has an inverse. 
doing nothing changes nothing, so you have an identity, and you can figure out the rest. The point is, groups are more abstract even than numbers are, so we can apply them to a wide variety of things, and one of those is symmetry. For some geometric objects, like our starfish, we can construct a symmetry group with the set of all transformations that leave it unchanged and composition of those transformations. So let's look at something more interesting than our starfish with bent arms. How about a single water molecule? And yes, this is H2O, not the trademark infringing head of a certain mouse. Clearly, translating it in any direction will change it. But what about rotation and reflection? The x-axis is meaningless. It takes 360 degrees to get back, and so is the y. But rotation around the z-axis has two-fold symmetry. For reflection, you can mirror the molecule around the xz plane or the yz plane. Together with the identity, that's four symmetry operations. And it should be easy to see that those are closed under composition. Each one has an identity element and so on. You can prove to yourself that this meets the group axioms. Chemists call this the C2V point group, in case you were curious. Like I said, a single water molecule doesn't have translational symmetry. But what if we had a lot of water molecules, all arranged in a nice pattern? This thing does have translational symmetry, and we call it a crystal. Specifically, since we're talking about water, this is ice. The most common phase of ice is a hexagonal crystal, since the angle between hydrogen atoms and water is pretty close to the tetrahedral angle. That's why snowflakes have six-fold rotational symmetry. When you consider every possible symmetry group with translational symmetry, you get what we call the space groups. There are 230 space groups in 3D, 219 if you don't count the ones that are mere images of others. So mathematically, there are 219 crystal shapes that can exist. That number is very hard to wrap my head around, so let's think about 2D instead. We call the set of space groups in two dimensions the wallpaper groups, since wallpapers have repeating patterns. There are 17 wallpaper groups. That means that every wallpaper, every fabric, every tiling, if it's periodic, and every M.C. Escher tessellation can be categorized as one of these groups. I went through Escher's works to see if I could find all 17, and I couldn't quite find them all, but he does use a good variety. Using this diagram, it's a fun exercise to try to classify a pattern that you see. So far, all of the symmetry groups that I've shown you deal with discrete symmetry. The transformation is always a finite amount. A square is symmetric up to 90 degree rotations. But what about a circle? A circle can be rotated any amount, and it still looks the same. So the symmetry group of rotations of a circle will contain an infinite number of transformations, but it still forms a valid group. We call a continuous symmetry group a Lie group. This one is called the special orthogonal group. Equivalently, you could define it as the group of all 2x2 two two matrices that have a determinant of 1. If you move up to three dimensions, you get SO3, the rotation group of a sphere. Now, rotation groups in 3D are interesting. Imagine two of the transformations in this group, a 90-degree rotation around the x-axis and a 90-degree rotation around the z-axis. If you do x first, then z, then the sphere ends up like this. But if you do z first, then x, it ends up like this. So composition is not commutative. Order matters. We call a group that is commutative an abelian group. Unlike SO2, SO3 is non-abelian, and so is the Rubik's Cube group, which is one of the things that makes the Rubik's Cube an interesting puzzle. Circles and spheres also have mirror symmetry. When you add that in, you get the orthogonal group that covers rotation and reflection. What if we add in translation? Just like how adding translation turned a water molecule into ice, our sphere group becomes empty space. This is the Euclidean group, the group of all transformations that preserve distance and keep empty Euclidean space looking the same. You could probably argue that the Euclidean group is the most studied group in the history of mathematics, although addition on the integers is a close contender. 
We've been doing geometry for a very long time, and until only very recently, we thought that Euclidean space represents the world we live in. But modern physics has pointed out a few important differences. In 1956, the Wu experiment demonstrated that all known fundamental forces except the weak interaction are symmetric under reflection. That means that if you performed a mirror reflection on our universe, it would be different. So that's one less symmetry than the Euclidean group. The other big upset in our understanding of symmetry came in 1905, in Einstein's Anus Mirabilis. According to special relativity, we don't live in a 3D Euclidean space that changes as time goes on, but in a 4D space-time. But don't get ahead of yourself. We still thought that those three spatial dimensions were Euclidean at that point. Let's not introduce general relativity quite yet. Once you throw a time dimension into the mix, a few more symmetries appear. Remember that the symmetries defined by the Euclidean group preserve distance. In 4D space-time, we're instead interested in transformations that preserve the space-time interval. We get distance by using the Pythagorean theorem. We get space-time interval by using the Pythagorean theorem, but with time multiplied by the speed of light and negative. This negative sign sounds really arbitrary, but remember, I didn't pick this, and neither did Minkowski or Lorentz or Einstein. If you just assume that the speed of light is the same for all observers, then when you do the math, it turns out that this value, rather than this, stays the same in any reference frame. So what that means is that in the universe of special relativity, the three spatial dimensions can be rotated and translated and physics doesn't change. That's like we always thought. But in addition to that, the universe is symmetric under translation in time, right? The laws of physics are the same now as they will be in five minutes. And the universe is symmetric under something that we call a Lorentz boost. A boost is a sort of rotation between time and spatial dimensions. But again, because of the negative sign in front of time, the math is a bit funny. What this really corresponds to is a moving observer. When you move at a constant velocity, the space-time interval has to stay the same, but distance doesn't. So that's why you get things like length contraction and time dilation and all the stuff that we're familiar with from special relativity. When you put all of these symmetry transformations together, you get the Poincaré group. That just about brings us to where we are today. The universe of general relativity does have some different symmetry than this, but the thing is, we still don't know how general relativity fits in with everything else. A flat Minkowski space-time, on the other hand, not only describes special relativity, but also quantum mechanics and particle physics, the standard model, basically everything else has been reconciled. It just fails when we look at things like cosmic microwave background or black holes, you know, really big things. For that reason, I think it's fair to stop here. Our universe is symmetric under spatial translation, time translation, no reflections allowed, spatial rotation, and Lorentz boosts. But I can't honestly say that with any level of finality. There are so many unsolved problems in the symmetry of our world. If we did know exactly what was symmetric, then most of physics would be solved. And that's not going to happen anytime soon. I don't even have Escher's tessellations solved. 